Do 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 do. Happy Wednesday. Let me hook up my little device. What's going on, guys? What's up, Riley Jacob? What's going on, people? Tasha. Great day. Good. What are we going to talk about tonight? What are we going to talk about tonight? Is webinar for tomorrow, 10 a.m. Eastern or Pacific time? I don't know what webinar you're talking about. What webinar? Oh, you guys see my little bird back there? I painted that bird. It was pretty cool. The Woman of Color, of color in Government Contracting is happening August 5th. Okay, very nice. Did you send me, send me some info so I can um, tell people about it? Yeah, start off as a blank canvas. Well, it was good. I actually just woke up from a nap. I was tired today. I've been up all morning. I was beat. So, I just woke up. What do you guys want to talk about? Does anyone have any questions for me today? Before I start running my big mouth, like, you know, you talk about it on your YouTube video. Hmm. GSA. What about GSA? What do you want to know about GSA? Hold on. IT security contracts and working. Okay. So someone asked about IT security contracts and working. Um, what's up, Bridget? What's up, Corey Oliver? Um... You know, GSA has got all types of contracts, right? Um, When we look at IT in particular, GSA has the the gamut. Hold on. By the way, I'm reading the questions. I didn't know that people could put questions in here, so I'm reading them. Okay. Um, Deal, do, search for business. So I'm not really sure exactly what... The, they want to ask about in terms of IT, but I will say this: um, for IT, we have a Facebook group specifically for IT and telecom, and we are looking at all of the opportunities that are like possible, like everything possible in the IT spectrum, and we're dropping that inside the Facebook group, and you can interact with people on it. What I like actually is that literally. Uh, yesterday, inside of our GovCon Giants community, one of our students, he's re- he's really like crushing it with IT, and he picked up a consultant client that does about, I think they're $20 million a year. Um, and so what he's doing is they are going after IT like really hard, and then we have other people in there that have companies they work for that are looking for small businesses like yourself. Uh, okay, now this person's asking about the GSA webinar tomorrow on the quarterly mass transportation. That's just something I publish. It's not. I mean, I'm not leading that webinar, so that's I'm just sharing with you the webinar and the information that exists. I I, I don't really know um, other than what I've already shared on YouTube. I don't know any more information because they haven't made anything publicly available until it's. So the webinar have actually happened. So I don't know anything about it specifically. Uh, 
All right. Um, that's an excellent question. Okay, the question my man JR says is, with so many GSA, GWACs, and IDIQs, it's still worth it chasing contracts to supply software or hardware to agencies. Now, I actually like that question. That's a really good question. And I'll tell you why. It's funny because my guy just literally in our Facebook group, I mean, yesterday in our Facebook group, our GovCon Giants group, he literally said that he went after an RFI source of thought and that there was only one company that responded. So I think what's happening is uh, everyone is chasing after, like, again, the, the big shiny object. And there's a lot of stuff that people are neglecting. I had the same experience when I first, my very first contract that we were looking at up in the Northeast. There were projects where you'd have 25 contractors. But then there were certain jobs where no one showed up. And it was just really strange and really weird. And I remember the very first like sole source that I got was the Department of Interior National Parks. The lady said, hey, I've got this project that's like just over a million dollars that no one is bidding. Right. And everyone assumed the same thing that you're saying is that, well, everyone's going after all this stuff. Just the fact that they exist doesn't mean everyone's going after it, because I can tell you and Bridget is in our group. Maria is in our group. In fact, I, I think I'm going to grab a snippet and put it on YouTube so you guys can hear it. But he literally said that on this particular opportunity, which is about $45 million, only one company submitted. So I think that's false. That people, um, that that is the case, that people assume that everyone is going after everything and that everyone's bidding all this stuff, that that's not really happening. Yeah, on the GWAX, because those are widely published, those are widely issued, but then you've got a lot of other miscellaneous software, IT, hardware that, again, another student of mine last year, Justin Adams, he literally picked up like a software renewal contract that, I mean, the prime took for granted. In fact, I just finished making a video that I'm going to put on YouTube today about how a lot of my guests on my podcast, they took over contracts that other people literally just took for granted and assumed that they were going to have it forever. They stopped doing their work. They stopped being on top of their jobs. They didn't value or appreciate the workers or the people that was actually handling it on a day-to-day basis. And so when they start, they started basically slipping. And when they slipped, somebody came in and took the, the contract from underneath them. So um, I definitely want to share that. Okay. Da 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 da. Da 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 da. DLD search for business. Um, I don't know of any specific search that you need for business. Um, I really don't know of any DLD specific search that you need for business. So, I don't really know of that. Yes, JR State of Course. Um, I don't know what you mean by search. I don't I don't know of any search for business. We um I actually just we just signed another contract. I got another contract awarded today that was four point nine million and um we got one that was which DLD. I got another million last week DLD and we don't have any um certs. So I'm not I'm not sure what kind of certs that you're asking about that you've heard of. Maybe you may want to suggest some certs that you think that, uh, that you, so I can get, I can get a picture because I don't really know what search you're talking about. They just asked, can we, can we do the work and we negotiate? And we've, we've already along the course of getting to know them demonstrated that. Okay, someone asked, do you need capital? Yes. You know, you need capital, you need a team, you need past performance, you got to have some experience. Absolutely. Now, that's if you want to be a prime, right? 
if you want to be a prime, you're definitely going to have all those things. So that's why I always tell people it's not always best to try to be the prime contractor on these contracts, right? Because if you want to be like the man, like this is, you know, you supposedly uh, are the one that has a contract with the government, then you've got to have all that plus some. So, you know, I always say to folks that, look, when you're getting started, better off be a subcontractor or maybe be a consultant. And when I say consultant, consultant comes in so many forms. It's not just like, well, I got my own business, so I don't need to be a consultant for my Look, <laughs> my, my guess, that's a very, if you listen to my podcast, it's a very common path to get into the marketplace because the government, it doesn't matter how big your company is, the government is even bigger. So it don't matter how much money you think you have, the government got more money and they're bigger than you. Meaning that if you do, even if you have got experience doing a million dollar contract in the government space, that same contract might be worth 10 million. And you're like, well, I, I, don't, I never did 10. Um, you know, if you do 10 million, that same contract in the government space might be 100 million or 50 million. So then you still are not going to ever be there exactly to be able to really like, you know what I'm saying? Like uh, match up in terms of your cap- your capability, your capital and all this kind of stuff. So it's just different. It's They're much bigger. They're much more vast. The, uh, and then they're much more complicated in a sense that a lot of times the government will they'll lump in a bunch of different scopes of services on top of just what you want to do. So if you do if you do like say concrete, yeah, you may get a paving contract. Like let's say you pave a whole like flight line, but then it might tell you throw in like do all the lights. And you're like, well, I don't do lights. I just do paving. The government says uh, the way that we're going to send this contract is we need someone to do all the paving and all the lights. We're not doing paving and lights separately. So, you know, my what I've seen and what, again, we continue to share with folks out there is that take a look at what some of the people who have already successful, what they're doing and the path that they've taken and look at it and say, OK, that, you know, that that makes sense. Why did they do that? Right. What was the reason for that? And a lot of folks, again, to get experience, to get past performance, um, you know, they did. They were some of them were 1099ers. Just frankly, a lot lot of them were 1099ers. A lot of people that came into professional services industry, they start off as a 1099 contract worker. Right. When you're starting your business, you don't have money to hire a bunch of people Um, and no bridges. They didn't actually do joint ventures. They actually did teaming arrangements. They were subcontractors. They were 1099 workers. So, again, a lot of people out there. In fact, one of our podcast folks just joined us. Welcome. And um, so a lot of people out there, they, you know, they took that path. And so that's a very common path. And that's one of the ones I recommend to folks out there. Doesn't I would not. I would not. I would strongly. It's, it's just so far few and in between the people that are watching this that again if you're asking these questions you are not in a position to be a prime and that's just just the truth uh, it could hurt you and I can tell you at the same token is for for the majority of us whatever your your wildest dream your biggest goal ambition is you could probably accomplish that at least in the in the onset just being a subcontractor one of my guests, she literally made the Inc. 500 list and she never was a prime contractor. She was a subcontractor and she did staffing. Just as a stub. Just working for a lot of the, the big DLD firms out there. Uh, again, some of these companies are doing $8 billion, $2 billion, $6 billion, $7 billion. I mean, they could make you an eight-figure company just alone, on them, just as a sub to them. So there's no reason why um, you have to necessarily go that route. So going back to that person's question, do you need money? Yeah, you're definitely going to need money. And if you don't have any money, right, to say, then then it's really a lot of people are like, oh, I'm, I'm bidding these contracts, I'm bidding this job. And, I, and I'm like, do you have any money to do the work? Like, no, 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 no. So if you don't have any money to be able to pay, to even be able to help you to make sure you're doing things the right way, 
Like, how are you going to be able to execute and perform and deliver responsibly? And it just, again, think about that. And going back to a video I made a few weeks ago, take a look at what are some of the requirements and see, do you have them before you just waste your time bidding? A lot of people get into, I think it's like a dopamine rush where we just want to bid contracts. And it seems very exciting for us just to bid contracts. Um, but the reality is, like, you know, when I, what I talk about, what I share, you know, when I was on the SBA, if anybody you guys were on that training, you'll see that the majority of stuff that we got was through literally, um, the majority of stuff we got was literally from doing market research, capture management, business development. That's the majority of where our work came from. Uh, it wasn't just blindly bleeding to random people. Like someone said, um, just weak to me, I would rather, you know, go a mile deep than a mile wide. So just keep that in mind when you're out here doing it. Let me see what other questions we have. Um... Yes, J.R. Miguel. Um, how to be a subcontractor. Very easily. I mean, find out. There, there's people that are winning contracts every day. We're winning contracts. It's public information. The same way that you're looking for opportunities, find people that are winning contracts that are in the space that are, that again, when I used to be in construction, in terms of, uh, like, I went a contract at a military base. Someone would always call me up and say, hey, uh, I looked at that job. You know, I want to do your lightning protection. I got a price for lightning protection. Do you need a price for lightning protection? Hey, um, I've already priced out the job. I did the electrical. So what I like to say is, is uh, I know in my space, when we get projects, we haven't necessarily bought out the whole contract, meaning that we haven't chosen all of our subcontractors when I win the job. So, for example... The one that I just won uh, this week was for a parking garage. And so we don't have all of our subs. We don't have all the contracts and everything in place. So we literally, and so someone called me up and said, hey, uh, you know, I heard you guys just won this parking garage contract and we do concrete, right? Or we do the striping. Well, I'll look at your numbers. I will look at your price. I'll consider you for that striping package because we haven't issued contracts to anyone yet. So we literally just got the award. I haven't even decided on the people who we can issue contracts to. Yes. Do we have people that priced it in the beginning? Absolutely. Um, but again, depending upon where the people are at in a contract and a project, uh, I've been on numerous, numerous, numerous jobs and, and projects where the subcontractors fell apart. They didn't come through. And so what happened was literally they reached out to me and said, Eric, do you know anyone that could do this drywall package? And the, the package is like a $2 million package. So we literally were like, you know, we could have referred any of our friends to help pick up this package because at the same time, one of the things that I think we, we don't think about, and I've said this before, is when you win a contract, you're really, really happy, right, when you win this big contract. But then it's time to go to work. So th at the same token that you're celebrating and you're happy, you're like, yeah, 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 wow, we won this big contract. Congratulations. The other, the next team that's got to take over and, and put this, implement this, at least for us, they're like, oh, crap. Okay, now we got to go to work. Now, like, now we got to make this happen. Now we have to actually do this and execute. And that's also scary, right? So you're happy, but then you're scared because you have to now perform and deliver. And I think so many people forget about the, the delivery, the execution, the performance factor. They're only concerned about the winning. The winning is great, right? But then you have to actually deliver, perform, execute. And that's where, again, a lot of my guests talk about delivering excellence, being on time, being present. Um, that's that's a whole nother arena. So, you know, what I'm saying is we get contractors that don't, don't come through. We get subs that are not reliable like anybody else. It's just human nature. So how do you become a subcontractor? Reach out to people. I literally, 
um, one of the contracts that we're talking about, one of the bases that we're working on today was because some the, the, the main construction company at this facility took it for granted and they started deteriorating in terms of the quality that they were delivering to the clients. So last year we found out that this particular sub was going to be, I mean, basically they're removing them from the base because they were no longer delivering quality performance. They weren't uh, being, they weren't, there were, there's a lot of things that they were making mistakes on. And so the, the base was like, Hey, look, we want to find another main contractor to help run the base. And that's kind of where we had already been talking to them. We had been in their air. We had been letting them know we exist and we showed up and we were present. And that's how we started, you know, slowly making our name known with a small project, deliver that a little bit bigger project, deliver that, and then continue growing um, to bigger and bigger projects until we actually literally uh, received an IDIQ to basically any types of construction jobs they could throw inside that IDIQ. Someone asked about payment. Um, yeah, how often does the government pay? Most of, most of my, again, I can only speak about construction because that's what I do. Uh, most of the time we got paid 30 days. Um, sometimes we get paid 15 days of progress payment, but most of the time it was net, it was 30. Right? Dun, dun, dun. Oh, I didn't realize I was supposed to touch this thing while answering. I guess I learned something new tonight. I want to bid and get a position for an awarded contract and being a consultant. Yeah, I think... um, Bridget, you can ask a question now. I didn't realize I'm on, I was on there. Hold on. Okay. I'm still learning this stuff. So you guys just bear with me on this whole, you know, IG live stuff. I'm still learning it. By the way. Okay. So it looks like I answered through those questions. What else? 15 days from signing day or complete day. You know, it's funny. I'm going to say this. Um, Getting paid is obviously a big concern. But I can tell you this. If if you're if you're your difference between 15 days and 17 days and 19 days of survival, you definitely got to start out a little bit smaller because um, if something happens, the paperwork is not right. Your forms are not right. Your 15 day could turn to 30 days. 30 days could turn to 45 days. Like we've been on projects where, and again, this is this is really important. I want everyone to understand that if you're if you're that tight where the two days matters, you've you've got to you've got to partner or work with someone else who could kind of help float some of that for you because you're really gonna have a hard time if you know trying to focus on getting your business done and. And at the same time, trying to make payroll or pay whatever expenses you have. My suggestion would be whatever uh, areas, because because I, I hear this from people all the time, is, you know, they're like, well, I don't have my credit. I don't have, you know, I don't have my, um, I, I was trying to get like a, a loan from the bank or I couldn't get a, a loan from my credit card or something like that. You, you're really already on the edge, right, to where I would always say, It's probably better to be a subcontractor or a 1099er, something like that, where you could actually float the actual time, right? The 30 days, because just being that concerned, like, I mean, right now, I can tell you right now, I just, we did some of the Library of Congress uh, and Maria could tell you, I I don't know how long it's been since they paid us. I mean, yeah, I want to get paid, but I'm at the same time, I'm not blowing these people's phone up, like, get my money, get my money, get my money today. Like this, you know, I look, stuff happens. It, they could blame coronavirus. They could blame whatever. You can't be that desperate. You got to be able to have more working capital. Uh, you got to be able to have some float. You got to be able to have uh, some reserves to be to, to do this. Like this is this is this is real. Um, and 
I've said it before. I'll say it again. When we delivered PPE to Florida and Texas, I think Texas took 60 days to pay me. I think Florida took, you know, um, I think Florida literally took, I don't know. I, I can't remember, but they took a long time to pay. Right. They told me Florida actually told me they're going to pay me in five days and they didn't pay in five days. Right. Like it was it was like 50 days they paid. And and I was more I was I was more concerned about the states running out of money than I was about like the money that we had out there because we had already taken care of that piece. So I think you have to figure that out. Um, And that's really what the, the longest time wise that I've done in terms of not getting paid. Uh, what's the longest job time wise wise you have you done i i'm not okay so the longest job time i've done i don't know the question but in terms of maybe longest project or the longest time i've gone without getting paid the longest time i mean i've done projects that were two years long um and i know friends of mine if we talk about terms of how long they waited to get paid I've, i've got friends of mine that work on state contracts like was hurricane relief and disaster relief where uh, the state of Florida or the school board of somebody is taking nine months to pay them. So I know people that waited nine months to be paid on a state contract before. Nine months. Nine. Nine. So, um, you know, that's that's a tough gig. That's why I don't really, that's why I, I'm not a big fan of encouraging people to chase uh, state and local work. Yeah, it's a great way, if, you know, it's a stepping stone, but also... Um, I've just had, I just have a lot of experience with horror stories and I always suggest to people that in your local municipality or area, and again, they all vary, right? Um, just talk to them about that. Like there's nothing wrong with asking them about how often are people being paid, right? Like any one of us, wherever we live, whatever city municipality, they have a board for small businesses, uh, for, you know, community small businesses, uh, CSBEs, DBEs, they have organizations that that there's like a, a board that you can go to and and participate and ask those kind of questions. See what how long is it the time frame in which people are being paid? You can actually go and participate. I would encourage most people out there that are listening to to go out there and learn this stuff. Don't just sit back and take the word of a person on a, a social media network, right? Because look, I don't live in your city. But I can tell you that from experience and from talking to a lot of guests around the country, it's it's more common that you're getting paid slower on the lower contracts than you are getting paid faster. And that's why for me, like I like federal because I just don't hear those same type of horror stories, right? We get paid on time. We're getting paid quickly. Um, and again, like Maria said in the chat, you know, she does a lot of work with the Coast Guard. Uh, I do a lot of work with Navy. Uh, I do work with the army. So, and again, we, you know, the, the the money flows and the contracts are being paid out. Yeah, Philly EV. Yeah, I got paid along the way. I got paid every 30 days on that two-year contract. We got, we would, we would have to invoice. Now, now that's a good question. So Philly EV asked me on my two-year contract, how often did I get paid? So let me give you two examples. Um, on that particular contract, the way that it works is, and I was a sub. It was a twenty million dollar project. I was a sub. You had to have your invoices turned in by the twenty fifth of the month to get in on the next payment cycle. So if you did not have your invoices and your documents submitted by the twenty fifth of the month, so let's say we're today, we're in July, and I think t- today is July twenty eighth. If I, if you miss your July invoice month, then you don't get paid in August. So then you would have to submit in August and get paid in September. But they literally had a cutoff time. So again, all the subs had to have their invoices turned in by the 25th to get paid for the following month. And if you didn't do that, you didn't get paid that following month. You had to skip a whole month. But yes, we did get paid every 30 days. Now, let me flip a different different scenario. I had another contract that was, it probably was about a year-long contract. And we only got paid twice on that contract. And, and this is this is kind of what I'm saying. There's no, everything holds certain, right? The government is, there's so many ways in which they can buy stuff. The reason was they issued us a construction project, but it was called a furniture contract. 
so that the way that the government got their funding was I don't know if my thing stopped moving. I don't know what happened. Um, somebody let me know if I'm still alive. Just like message me, Maria Bridges. My okay. Oh, I see someone just joined. So one of my um, projects that we were awarded, and this was like 2012 or something like that. They awarded us a. It was construction, but they called it. Thank you guys. It was a construction project. But they called it a furniture contract because that's the way the government requested the funds. So it was to put up a hangar. But what they said was the hangar is like a desk. Like so, when you buy, when you provide a desk to the government, when you deliver the actual assembled desk, then the government pays you. Now on my contract, the assembled desk was an assembled hangar. Well, the hangar was sixty thousand square feet, and it was thirteen bays. So you don't exactly assemble a hangar overnight. The hangar had the it came in parts, components, and took teams, and it was a like six months to build it on top of three months to to actually engineer it, design it, and get it ready. We didn't know when we took this project on that this was a furniture contract because we were very new and green to the contracting world. So we thought that it was like a typical construction project that we build every thirty days. To our surprise, it was not like that. And the project was two, it was just around $2 million. And we were very new, very early stage. Uh, you know, we didn't have that kind of money to float $2 million, put this way. And it, our cost was about $1.7 million. Let's say $1.7, $1. yeah, about $1.7 million. We did not have $1.7 million to float. Just, we didn't even have like, we had probably like a half a million max that we could tap into. Um, before we were like just out, like just flat, like homeless, uh, and we didn't know this. So, so it's it's really, and I and I still like I don't even remember what made it that contract that way because it all depended on the funding that the government issued and how they requested the funding. So what we did was, fortunately for us, we had been working with that particular agency for a couple of years now on some much smaller things, and. And so the one of the contracting guys, he wasn't on that particular vehicle, but he had experience in, in actually doing contracting for the government. He said to us, look, why don't you petition the contract to say, hey, it's a small business contract and you need they, they should pay you. Like you, can, you shouldn't be expected to float a two million dollar contract um, and then get paid only when you deliver. And so we did that. We went back and we we, we wrote a letter to and I believe this was the uh, the Air Force, we wrote a letter and said, hey, this is a small business contract. We think that it's unfair. We think it's been miscategorized as a furniture contract, and we should be allowed to have at least an additional payment included a, because what they call it in construction is progress payment. So as you're going through progressing, right, then you get paid. So we petitioned the government literally and said, hey, we believe we should be uh, fairly awarded a progress payment because it's unrealistic to think that a small business can float a $2.1 million contract and get paid at the end. It's just not realistic. And they heard us out and they they granted us a, a one-time intermediate payment on this project. And so what we did was, and I, and I talked to people about this. This is why to me... Um, and I'll say this here, it's only recently, it's only really recently, like like this year, that my credit score ever surpassed 680 for the first time in like my whole life. Before that, my credit score was like 630, 640, 650, but I got supplier credit, I got vendor credit. So I was, I always paid my vendors, I always paid my suppliers, even though like life happened to us. And again, I was never wasteful, I didn't, I didn't have a lot of credit card debt intentionally um i just always had businesses and i and you know, i borrowed money for my companies but i literally always got supplier credit and vendor credit so the building manufacturer actually gave me extended me because the building itself was about seven hundred thousand. i had credit for the entire cost of the building so guess what i couldn't get a line of credit i couldn't get a bank loan i couldn't get any of the stuff that people traditionally are saying that you should go get and most of my 
most of my podcast guests can't get those things either when they first started. They couldn't get bank loans, and I, I, maybe I got a small SBA loan. But literally, um, I had a supplier credit, vendor credit for the building. So now, check this out. I got a $2 million project, um, and the only thing we could do was we could get the building supplier credit. And so what we did was we lumped in the engineering costs, we lumped in the building costs, and we lumped in a large part of our actual labor uh, costs, right? We lumped it into our first billing. And so my first billing that we built the government, um, we literally... We literally, I think it was like we built like 1.2 million when we delivered the actual building. That fortunately, the manufacturer floated me the money for the building. Not the money, but they actually delivered the building. I didn't have to write a dollar out of pocket. So they delivered the building to the government. I was able to use that building, that building to send the government an invoice because we actually delivered something to the job. And so we actually literally were able to build them the 1.7 million. I got the money to pay the building back, right? So I paid them after 700,000 and then now we had like a half a million dollars in capital to actually front to start doing the job and get the guys out there and working. And that's how we were able to, to literally um, float that big project. But uh, again, it was a combination of several things that took place. And even still on top of that, I mean, like my partner, he was like scrounging, doing other jobs to literally help bring in money Right. So we could keep going. And I mean, it was it was tough. It was tough. Uh, but at the end of the day, we survived and we made it. And then we we literally were able to, you know, pull off a two million dollar job. We added, you know, an extra four or five hundred thousand dollars into our account. And so that gave us the ability to go on and take on other types of projects. So, you know, it's just you got to do what you got to do. You know, one of the things that someone said to me was do what you can with what you have, where you're at. And I really strongly believe that a lot of people are not um, trying, to, not even attempting to do that, right? They're not even attempting to, to do what they can with what they have, where they're at. They're so far down the road about, well, what about this? What about that? What about what you could do right now? Like, what about what are the things that you can control right now, where you're at right now, with, with the resources that you have today? How about start with that? Right. Let's let's not go way out here into the Space Force world. Like, get, I get it. Look, trust me, I've got big dreams. I got big ambitions as well. But I'm also working in the space that I could work in right now, given the resources that I have, given the team that I have, given the players that I have. Yeah, I'm looking forward, but I'm not. A lot of times what I'm hearing everyone on here asking questions about, it seems like to me they're, they're being paralyzed at the same time because they are so far out into the things that they don't have, the resources they don't have, um, and they're not sitting here saying, well, what the resources that I have, what are some of the things that I can be doing? And I, and I think that's so important, and, and I'm glad Maria's on here in the chat because she's giving you guys also real-life examples of doing what you can with what you have. Maria and I are, you know, we're in, doing totally different things, uh, but we're both working in the federal marketplace, Okay. Um, she's working on her, her projects and I'm working on my projects. Um, she's doing things, you know, herself a lot of times she's still managing her projects. She's still like boots on the ground. I'm doing things at a much higher level with teams, bigger teams, large teams, multiple companies, multiple entities, multiple people, but that's what I could do with what I, with what I have and where my capacity is at. And then she's handling what she can and where she's at, what, what her capacity is. So, you know, I think that a lot of us, we're not, we're not, we're taking it for granted what we already have, where we're already at, and some of the skills, some of the tools, some of the resources that are already in within our our sphere of influence, our 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 immediate vicinity. We're not even taking advantage of the stuff that we already know and that we already can do. So I, I you know, I just, I really believe that that's that's so important out there because. I just see so many people focusing on the negative, focusing on the, I don't have a certificate, focusing on, well, I don't have, um, you know, I don't have bonding or I don't have a line of credit or I don't have credit lines. Let me tell you something. I just got the phone with someone that's in our group that literally got the EDL loan 
And I'm going to tell you guys because she just told me this today. She went, she received like, I think she told me thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 on the EDA loan. She went back and she told, she called the SBA and she said she wanted a reconsideration because she thinks she made a mistake on her application. And she literally asked for 30000 more and they gave her 30000 more. How many of you out there would do that? How many people out there listening? And I can even tell you my accountant told me, Eric, no, nah, you can't do that. How many of you would have tried that? How many of you would have actually said, you know what? The government didn't even spend all the money that they have for PPP and EDL, right? This person literally went back to the SBA and said, you know what? I want to be reconsidered. I think I made a mistake on my application. Throw in me another $30,000. That's what she did. How many of you would have been so paralyzed that you didn't even try it? Like you didn't even, like, I didn't even know that was possible. How many folks out there, that's what they're constantly thinking is like, yeah. And Colin says, look, to be, to, if you want to actually start off as a subcontractor, you don't even need no certifications. I did not have any certifications. I was a subcontractor, don't have any certifications. And guess what? People want folks that could do good quality work. It's not about certifications. I have a video that says, why are people so hung up on certifications? I don't understand that. Companies want quality workers. They want quality companies that can deliver, that can perform. That is more important than a certification. I always say this. Don't leave with certifications. You're going to embarrass yourself because a lot of times people actually get turned off when you say, oh, I'm a woman-owned business. What do you do? What is your business? Oh, I'm a minority on business. Excuse me. Hello. What is your business? Can I look? I want to know about your business. What do you do? What is what can you help help me with? They're not here to say, oh, I, uh, oh, I'm just looking for a woman on business that does anything. That's not people are not there. You will never see a request publicly that says we want a women on business. Uh, we don't care what you do because we're just looking for a minority business. That's not what the people are advertising. They're saying we want an electrical company. We want a um, we want a paint company. We want an IT company. We want a software developer. We want an AWS developer. We want a SharePoint developer. They have very specific requests in there. And by the way, if you happen to be some of these things, that's even better. But the first thing they want is a really good contractor. All of us, it doesn't matter who they are, uh, they want good contractors. Uh, I see here one of our GovCon giants saying, look, that's not my pain point. I need a quality company. That's not Their pain point is not a woman-owned business or a minority business or a certification business or a hub of zone business. That's not, their pain point is not that. It's, I want a good company. I want a good contract. I want someone that shows up on time. Ask Maria. Today, when her and I were talking, she was like, okay, this guy didn't show up again. Right? I said, well, that's good. Because now you'll appreciate when you have good subcontractors that actually do show up. Uh, so, you know, that's that's very important. How to become a subcontractor? Again, we talked about that earlier. Uh, there are lots of people out there that are looking for subcontractors. I mean, there's a lot of people out there that want good quality subcontractors. Whatever, whatever it is that you offer, your skills, your, your company, your business... Um, find out the people who need those services um, and reach out to them. And they're going to take your calls. They're going to take your emails. They're looking for good contractors. In fact, one, there's two people, two or three people out here now that I guarantee you today, There's right now there's several people on this chat that are looking for good quality subcontractors. Right now that are on the chat that are in the same room as you. Uh, look, right here. I've per- Look, 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 look. Excel Cleaning Service has called me. I'm turning down work. She's laughing. Okay. She hear that? Call me. I'm turning down work, she says. So, again, this is, you know, you're asking how do you become a sub? Easy. Ask. <laughs> you IT worker, I just told you guys, I have a Facebook group. Go in the Facebook group. There's, prob- there's over 100 people in our Facebook group right now than IT and telecom. And I promise you, there's a lot of people that need IT folks out there. Um, someone said, Barbara, look, uh, Dana White was saying she's seen stuff on there for Barbara Services. Okay, I've seen stuff on there for a person that plays the organ. Um, I've seen stuff for, for preachers. I've seen things on there. So, Again, you don't have to ask on here on IG about finding IT worker. 
go look for this stuff. You, you know, you're not going to find the answer in a chat with only 22 people. You have to use Google. Google is your best friend. Okay. Who just won IT contracts? On my YouTube videos, I posted. On my Twitter feed, I posted some of the IT contracts. People want IT contracts. And those folks need people to do the work. So, again, there's, there's, that to me is the easiest, easiest thing in the world to actually do. Um, you just have to go look for it. And it sounds like to me that you haven't went and looked for it. Because if you do search or seek the information, you will find it. What else? So no one's jumping on tonight. What else we got out here? But yeah, definitely take a look. Look, I'm telling you, supply credit's big. Uh, we never had any bank loans. Good way to start out. Um, subcontracting is is a great first step for a lot of people out there with limited resources. I can tell you, even on top of this, we have one of our students that she literally, uh, she was in a group doing janitorial and her first contract, she met a guy at a conference or event and she said she does janitorial. Um, he was working on a negotiation for a large janitorial project. And again, this doesn't happen to everyone. So let's not take this as a norm, but she was very honest and candid and said, look, I don't have the money. He said, don't worry about it. He says, what we need is we need you to, to assemble 40 people uh, in the next week to basically work on this project. And she pulled it off in three days. And he literally, this I say he, but the, the, the prime um, paid her and was paying for her workers directly. And she had no money. And her first contract she got was a subcontractor um, where she's providing 40 people on a, on a janitorial project. And she's been doing that since April. So, um, again, I don't think you're asking. I don't think you're talking to anyone. I think that so many people, at least on this particular Instagram platform, are talking to people like myself out here and not talking to the people who have your money. I always say, go find out who has your money, right? Look, go on there and figure out what agency, what, what primes who have the opportunities, like you said, that have the pain points that need to be met and you can help meet those pain points. You talk like that and people are going to take you in your calls. They're going to listen to you. Um, they're going to definitely, um, hear you out. Right. And so that's kind of, you know, that's, that's, that's the way to go. Now let's see. I know this isn't going to happen for a while, but my dad wanted to ask, are there ever contracts for seats, boxes, sporting events? I don't know what that means, Jake. Seats and boxes for sporting events. I'm not really sure. Bridget, you got to ask the question. I don't know what question you're talking about. I'm only on IG. I can't read any other questions. I can't read no text messages, no WhatsApp messages. Only thing I can read is what's on this IG live because it has my whole phone blocked. So I can't read anything else right now. Um, Jake, ask me the question about seats and boxes again. I'm not sure. Jake, why don't you jump on? I think we have like 13 minutes left, by the way. IG is going to kick me off in an hour. So get your question in now or wait until next thir- next Wednesday or Monday on YouTube Live. How do you do what? I don't see it, Bridget. How do you do what, Jake? What is a seat? I don't know. I don't know what you mean, a seat at a sporting event. You want to sell them a chair? You want to say like a, a, a sexual physical chair? Is that what you're asking? Jump in. I don't know. I don't know why Bridget acting scared. I'm already said I'm laying down. Um, you know, Rodisha. I just you know again. Um, we just talked about. Go back and listen to this chat. Again, I tell people, don't lead with your certifications. Uh, it, it's, what's next for you is solve the pain points. Find out who, who act, you know, and, and this is a good example, right? Rodisha, she says, I'm woman owned and I'm EWSB. What's next for me? I don't know anything about her business. I don't even know how can, what can I offer her as advice when I don't even know what her business is about. That's, and that's what so many people make the mistake. Oh, what's up, Mo? And that's what so many people make a mistake at is they, t- they lead with, I have a certification. 
What is your business? We have people on here that does millions of dollars of business that may could use her service, but because she led with certification and not with what she does for a living, I can't even make a referral to her or make a reference because I have no idea. Right. And that's where, again, I want to use this example for so many people out there is that what is the pain point that you're trying to solve? I don't even know how to help you because I don't know what your pain point you're trying to solve. Okay. So now, okay, that, that, that's that. And this, look, again, part of, and I hope, I hope we all have thick skin because we're not, we're not here to, to pick on anybody. Obviously we're here to uplift people. I really believe in what I'm doing. Um, I really strongly believe that this is the pathway for so many of us. This is a great equalizer. This allows folks out here to put us on a level playing field with a whole lot of folks that we normally would not have the opportunity to be on that playing field with. So do not um, ever think that I have uh, anything but the utmost respect and admiration for anyone out here who's trying to start a business particularly uh, people that look like me, particularly women. Um, I really strong, like I'm like, again, and Maria will tell you this, we actually sponsored the U.S. Women's Chamber of Commerce with all of our women on podcast guests. We took out a full page ad in there because we really believe in the power of women. I really think that that's strong. But at the same time, part of what I believe my job is, is to help educate and make everybody better. Um, and so that's what we want to do. But at the same token, we just have to show using real life examples because sometimes when I just say something, like people don't always get it immediately until we can actually show with an example. So that was just a, an example to give. Uh, Bridget said, I was on GSA to find the right price. There are various prices. I don't want to over or underbid. What is the rule of thumb? The magic price. Um, you know, when you say the price, like that's a very open ended question. There's a lot of prices on there. Um, and so Bridget, like there's prices for labor, there's prices for materials, there's prices for, I mean, I, I don't know what you're asking for the price for what, what do you, there is no magic price, uh, pricing a job, by the way, is a science. Um, and so, you know, it's really like a lot of magic to pricing a job. So it's not, there's no, I, I mean, it's really hard. What I would suggest is this, uh, if you don't know how to price your job, if you've never done anything like this before, work with people who've done the pricing before so gain experience under their belt. That's what I would suggest. You know, that to me is the best advice I can give only because uh, pricing is such a art science conundrum that really the best thing to do is work with some people who've already done this before and learn from them how to price these jobs. I, I, it, every industry is different. There's no magic bullet. There's no silver bullet. Now, let me get back to Radisha's question about transportation, logistics. Okay, so um, this past week, I just interviewed people. Now, if you say freight brokering, freight brokering, um, okay, let's talk about that. Transportation logistics is different from freight brokering, first of all. Um, I just had on my show a couple people that are in the transportation and logistics side of the business for federal contracting. They do moving. They do interior, they do furniture design, they do interior layouts, uh, they move people from buildings and offices, uh, those kind, they do that and they, that's called logistics. Um, totally different from freight brokering. So so what I would say, Radisha, is stay tuned for my two podcast guests coming up. Um, one is called Proven Management and the other one is Tyson Management and they're both in the same space as you and I highlight and share their stories on upcoming podcasts. So I would say stay tuned for those episodes. They're really good episodes. They're exactly in the same vertical as you. And um, because they're, they're, they can probably better describe to you the process that they did. In fact, a lot of the things I was referencing today, today's talk was based on comments that I got from them. Um, both of those particular companies, uh, like I said, they're in the same space. And in fact, I didn't even know logistics involved moving. Um, one of them actually has the contract to do the moving at the Pentagon. Uh, another one has a contract that does moving at the White House. Uh, they have people working every day, moving staff and offices. So there's a lot of uh, opportunity in that space. And um, so for, for the next thing for you would be to find out, obviously, where are those opportunities at? 
uh, what I would say is if you – and again, I, and this is part of the advice that I tell everyone, even in my course. I say, look, go look at the companies that are successful in your arena and find out what they're doing. Find out uh, – you know, when I talk about how do you fill out your DSBS profile, go look at the, the guy, the big guy or big girl that you want to be after, like that has all the contracts that you want and find out how do they set up their profile? How do they set up their pages? And I call it modeling. Go model what they do. OK. And then once you set up your profile, and your pages just like them, um, Rodisha, this is that's what I would say. Then first, the next thing for you would be figuring out, OK, wherever you're at, whatever region, location you're at. Um, then what I would say is find out who's buying those types of services in your regional area. Who are those? Who are those particular agencies that are buying the the the, the transportation logistics stuff that you're in your area? Um, now, just I would just be cautious because again, freight brokering is very very different. I know a lot of people that do the trucks, um, and I know that if you want to start out with trucks itself. That typically you can't be a broker. You have to have what they call uh, what do they call that? My man's not on tonight, but uh, I think it's called the authority, right? You have to have the whole actual truck itself, and then uh, you they normally as a subcontractor they want you to have maybe five to ten trucks. So if you actually have physical trucks that you're looking to break into with actual trucks and, and drivers, um, what I've seen and from the people that I've talked to as a subcontractor, there's a lots of opportunity. But some of the primes want you to have at least 10 trucks because one or two trucks doesn't help them move the needle because they have really big contracts. So if you want to do the logistics side, that's different sell to realm. If you want to do the actual truck side, then um, we've got people in our group in Zach. And we actually have people here on Instagram that IG that have talked to companies that were willing to hire companies like yours to be a sub if you've got 10 or more trucks and they do that all day in fact Rodisha, what i would say if that's your quick your your gig uh someone earlier said that to, i think it's coming up um i put it on my twitter there's a can someone go to my twitter and find out there's a transportation webinar for the gsa mass contract schedule coming up um next month I would attend that, find out who are all the major players on that schedule, and then I would reach out to them and let them know I have 10 or trucks or whatever, however many trucks that you have. Okay, there's already so that's the same thing as being in a room with all the big boys. And if you have those things, um, I would not be surprised if you walked out of there without a contract. Because that's where the, like that schedule is is billions of dollars. So they want people like you that already have trucks that are ready to go. Okay, I'm trying to find the right price for my combined synopsis and illustration. I found various prices. Um, okay. Sorry. Go away. Okay. Yeah, I answered that price question already. I hope that helps, Manisha. Yeah, we there's a not a problem. Yeah, but there's but there's actually a really big event going on for trucking. That is with all the big contracts. So definitely, um, I've got it on my Twitter. I don't have it here. I can't share it with you because I don't have it here. Let me see. Maybe I could jump on my computer and find it for you. But it's definitely on my Twitter feed. Um, I've got one minute and 20 seconds. Oh, look at that. Someone already somebody pulled it up for you. Boom. Look at that. Someone just pulled it up and posted it in here. Look at that. We got some resourceful people out there. Okay, that's a truck and webinar link for tomorrow. There it is. All right. Look, I didn't even have to go grab it. That's the link. So uh, for all those folks that are in that industry, it's the webinars tomorrow. Take a look at it. Um, jump on that and, and let me know how it works out for you. But I will tell you this. Do me a favor, a big favor. When you go in there and you're meeting people, don't lead with I'm a woman on business. Um, lead with, you know, you said you have all of that. To me, if you if I would have led with, hey, by the way, I happen to have 10 trucks that are whatever the case may be. I've got 10 of these types of trucks, refrigerated trucks, tow trucks, whatever, and I'm ready to get started. 
if you lead with that and you tell them that you're, you're already doing that and you're done it, you've done it in, in 13 countries or 12 places, that's the what people want to hear. SBA does not help with funding contracts. No, that's a myth. SBA does not actually provide any funding. SBA, it 